Amen. I thank you, Liz. I hear the bell. I hear the bell ringing out there, and uh, I like uh, Kyle's opening. That's kind of that kind of looks kind of '70s, doesn't it? Something like that, '60s or '70s. Uh, thank you for being here today. Great to have you with us. Great to have you worshiping with us today. If you're with us today for the first time, a special welcome to you. We have had a lot going on these past couple of days, two or three days here at church. Uh, on Friday, we had a wonderful celebration of life, memorial celebration for Maxine Adams. And I want to thank uh, Rhiannon and especially Mabel for all the helping us with the logistics of all of that. So Mabel, she's, I don't see her, maybe she's exhausted. She's She's wiped out, but I appreciate Mabel, and we appreciate Mabel and Rhiannon and all they do to keep things functioning around here. And then yesterday morning, we gathered for our Change the World Day. It was our first ever Change the World Day. We had almost 35 people that were there in the social hall, and uh, the idea was that we were that we were heading out in different directions. We had projects that we had put together uh, to, uh, for the betterment of some of the groups that we work with on a regular basis. Uh, let me uh, show you a few pictures from that day yesterday. We gathered in the social hall, and this is a team that was assembling uh, UMCOR hygiene kits there in the social hall. Let's move that forward, Kyle. There's, there's a few of our happy workers and uh, let's, let's go ahead. There's some, uh, you know, we're putting toothbrushes in, and fingernail clippers in there and uh, just kind of put together a nice assembly line. And I believe they made somewhere in the neighborhood of 73 or 74 kits. And we have, we have most of the supplies for another 20 or 25. So we're hoping to put the rest of those together in the next week or so. And uh, then we had a group that went out to uh, what we would call the Wesley neighborhood property. So this is right across our parking lot, uh, cleaning a, a certain area there, uh, just on the other side of the church parking lot, but also out on Continental Street. Street. So there's some of our workers. There's Damon out there. This is out on Continental Street, and just kind of doing some basic spruce up. Here's uh, Here's uh, Dave out at, this is the, another project out at FaithWorks where some of our people were doing some landscaping out there and also some weeding and other kinds of work. Uh, let's go ahead, Kyle. This is, uh, that's John Leffler there uh, holding the ladder and a uh, lot of, uh, lot of uh, prep work going on with that shed. Let's go ahead. There's some of our... Uh, some of our weeders and landscapers out at FaithWorks, and uh, they did a great job out there. This is out at Cypress School. There's Beth. She's, uh, they're, they're literally putting down uh, different colored paint on the kindergarten parking lot, uh, or not parking lot, <laughs> kindergarten playground out there. They have a, you know, that's a four square, a four square area right there. The, the thing you saw before was a hopscotch, and they're kind of, doing their design work and getting bright colors down on the playground. There's Mary Burns, and uh, you know, that group was uh, out there all morning, and they did a great job. It just looked beautiful when they were done. So we're, we're grateful to all of those folks. Now, this is just a little sampling, a little taste. Thank you, Kyle. Little taste of uh, what happened uh, yesterday. Tomorrow, we are going to be... Uh, and tomorrow, next, <laughs> next Sunday, we're going to put together an entire video that, that kind of shows us in more detail what happened uh, at, on Change the World Day yesterday. But it was a lot of great work and, you know, people connected with one another. We connected with some of the, some of the groups that we work closely with. I want to thank Mary Burns for, and Church and Society Committee for helping to organize it. Also, our, our coordinator uh, point people for each of the different groups, Ellen Classine, and of course, uh, Beth Jordy out at Cyprus, and uh, Carol, Carol and Ed Whitmer, and Julia Major helped with the, the UMCOR kits there in the social hall. And then everyone that came out to make that such a great day. It was a day of great, uh, great fun and energy, and I think everyone uh, enjoyed getting out and, and sharing, uh, sharing their, their skills and their time and their talent with the community. 
Well, we, are, uh, we also want to thank you for uh, everyone who, we had a great Easter celebration a week ago. If you weren't here, it was awesome. And I want to thank everyone that contributed Easter lilies, which were all, all around up here. And uh, just lots of lilies donated in memory or honor of loved ones. And I, th- I want to thank you for that. I think there's still a few of the lilies out there. You can see them still uh, still here, we also had them out at Maxine Adams Memorial as well. Well, today we continue our Easter theme. We are an Easter people, and we're going to be talking about that today as we uh, talk about the ways that we live out being people of new life and hope and resurrection. That's our theme as we worship today. Again, as I said earlier, if you're here for the first time, a special welcome. We like to say whoever you are and wherever you are in your journey of faith, you are welcome here. Well, let's see, a couple of our musicians are gone today. Dave's gone and William's gone, but we have an awesome group of musicians here that are ready to lead us, and it's going to be great today. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing together, Awesome God.
Thank you, music team. Good morning and welcome. I'm Sarah Sunquist, your worship leader this morning, and thank you so much for worshiping with us today, whether you're in person or joining us on the live stream or later on in the week in our film version. We welcome you. Please take a moment to fill out your registration forms at the end of the pew. Uh, this just helps us keep better track of our attendance, and we hope that you will record your information. Also, in those white binders, you will find name tags to put on that will come in handy later on when we socialize. And as you exit out through the doors today, as you take a left, there will be restrooms down the hall, and on the left, also the stairway is there so that you can um, go down and hopefully join us later for snacks and fellowship. And if you wish to maintain social distance during our communion time today, that is not walking forward to um, have communion, just go ahead and raise your hand and one of the ushers will deliver one of the little communion cups so that you can participate from your pew. And finally, we invite all of you to join us this morning for a time of coffee, snacks, and fellowship downstairs in our social hall immediately following our service. And now here's Pastor Joe with a few remaining announcements. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Well, just a couple things today. First, uh, the tamales are here. Yay! The tamales are here. If you ordered tamales as part of our SSP uh, fundraising project, uh, you can pick them up today. I should mention that the tamales did not just walk through the door. They were handmade by our youth yesterday. So in addition to everything I showed you before with Change the World Day yesterday, our youth and parents were here yesterday, and they were tamale-making maniacs, okay, yesterday. And uh, let's take a couple of looks at that. Uh, there's, uh, there's some of the activity happening in the kitchen. That's youth and parents putting tamales together. And let's, let's go to the next one, Kyle. There's a, there's a close-up. That's what you're getting right there. There's a, there's a close-up of a tamale making in action, right? Let's go to the next one. There's a couple more of our youth, and they're preparing the corn husks. And uh, we actually have a little, uh, let's, let's run that little video to show kind of yeah, you know, this is not sped up. This is, they're moving right here. They're getting them down the line. So uh, we appreciate our youth and our parents. And, uh, you know, Anna Lilia Player is really the kind of the brains behind the whole operation here. In hours and hours of work, our youth made about a thousand tamales yesterday. So big thanks to... Big thanks to uh, Anna Lilia Player for guiding us on that project. This is her secret authentic recipe, by the way. And so uh, to go, so go to the tamale table downstairs to pick up your tamales. I've been told also that, that, that some extra tamales have been made. So if you did not pre-order any, you may also be able to buy some here today while supplies last, okay? Christine Fennell, our children's coordinator, is looking for parents and others who would wish to occasionally help with our Sunday School, our Wonder Years program. She is de developing a new rotation list right now. If you are interested in being a classroom helper, please talk with Christine. And finally, there is a large event coming up in the life of our community, and it's called Project Homeless Connect. And we've been a part of this for many, many years. Uh, this year it will be held on May 17th. That's right in the middle of the week. It's a Tuesday, May 17th. It's going to be held over at the Reading Library from 9 in the morning to 3. Now between now and then, you're going to see our socks box, which is right out in the lobby area. We are collecting pairs of new socks, which will be distributed to those homeless guests who are at the event that day. Damon Cropsey is in charge of this. And as I said, we've done this for many years. So bring socks over the next couple of weeks, bring socks for our socks box. They, they will be distributed directly to people in need. Now, Katie Swartz over at St. James Lutheran is coordinating Project Homeless Connect this year. She says Homeless Connect is a one-day resource event 
to connect those experiencing homelessness with essential services. The goal of Project Homeless Connect is to build relationships between providers and guests, providing immediate services all in one place and connect guests to future services and relationships. They anticipate over 500 guests. That means the folks who are coming there, homeless folks, and about 60 community partners. We're one of those community partners to participate in Project Homeless Connect this year. Katie says they are looking for people with compassionate hearts to help guide the guests throughout the day. We'll need individuals to help the guests check in to the event and then to direct people who are looking for various booths and resources. So if that sounds like you uh, and you want to help that day, let me know and I'm going to put you in touch with Katie Schwartz who can, uh, can get you uh, plugged into that. Okay, so that's an exciting thing happening not too far off. Well, we are now at that point where we're going to invite our children to come forward for their special time. Kids, come on down. Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Oh, good to see you today. Okay. You see that bowl of water? Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, we're going to try something that we tried a long time ago. I know some of you will remember this, but I've got a whole new way to do it now. We've got it all figured out this time. When we did this about two years ago, it didn't work quite right. Okay, but now, this time for sure. Okay, so here's the question. If I put this paper clip into the water, what's going to happen? What happened? It sank to the bottom. What if I told you I could get this paper clip to float on the water? Would you believe me? Mm, that's what happened two years ago. Okay. Now here's, this is my new technique. Watch, watch. It's going to work. Okay, see this? It's a little piece of paper towel. Now I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, it's gonna float. oh, of course, the paper towel's holding it up, right? That's what you're going to say. But just watch this. Ho, ho, ho. You guys see that? It's floating. Paper clip is floating. Do you guys know why that happens? Yes. Because, because half of it has to be underwater and half of it has to be on top. Well, I think it's being held, I don't know if it's really under or on top, but it's really more like the way the water, the way the water molecules come together, they, it creates a little bit of tension on the top of the water and it holds the paper clip up, right? Have you guys seen that before? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's see. I'll see if I can do it without the... Paper towel. Nope. Okay. Okay, wait, Pastor Joe, let's get to the point. The point is, the point is that you guys didn't think that paper clip would float, but now you've seen it, right? You've seen it, so you know it can happen, right? Well, I'm going to talk to the grown ups today about. So after the first Easter, okay, when Jesus rose on that first Easter, all of the disciples were excited because Jesus had risen, right? But there was one disciple, and he didn't believe it, okay, because he hadn't seen it. And he said, unless I see, it, unless I see Jesus, I'm not going to believe it, okay? 
So then Jesus appeared to him. His name was Thomas. Okay, don't pull this cord. Okay, don't pull that cord right there. Yeah. He, his name was Thomas. And then Thomas saw Jesus. Okay, don't, don't pull the cords. Okay, you guys. Um, he, J- Thomas saw Jesus. Okay. No, it, excuse me. You cannot pull these cords. Okay. Do not, co- do not pull them. Okay. No. Okay. Thanks. Um, so Thomas saw Jesus and then he realized Jesus is alive, okay? And so that's, that's part of what I'm saying today. It's like sometimes we have to see something to believe it. And Thomas had to see something to believe it. That's okay. Once he saw Jesus, then he knew that Jesus was alive. And Jesus is still alive for all of us as well. He's alive and he walks with us every day, okay? Can you guys remember that? Okay, you know, um, yeah, well, Jesus, Jesus is with us every single day. Now, we don't see Jesus walking, but we know it, we know it to be true, and we pray, we pray to Jesus each day, okay? So we're going to have a prayer right now. We're going to have a prayer right now to Jesus, and then we're going to go to Wonder Years, okay? So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for, for lessons in this, this science and just kind of looking and seeing things that we think couldn't possibly happen, but yet they do. And in the same way, we know those first disciples, some of them didn't believe, but then when they saw you, they knew that you were truly alive. Help us always to remember that as well. Watch over us, guide us, and walk with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming up, okay? Well, um, you guys are going to go to Wonder Years now. Where's Christine? Is, is that her? She's waving down there, okay? So you see Christine and head off in that direction, okay? We'll see you guys later. Whoops. Sons and daughters, let us sing the King of Heaven, the glorious King. For death and hell hath triumphing. Alleluia, alleluia. That Easter morn at break of day. The faithful women went their way to seek the tomb where Jesus lay. An angel clad in white they see, who sat and spake unto the three, Your Lord doth go to Galilee. Alleluia. That night the apostles met in fear, amidst them came their Lord most dear, and said, My peace be on all here. When Thomas first the tidings heard How they had seen the risen Lord He doubted the disciples' word My pierced side, O Thomas, see My hands, my feet I show to thee, not faithless, but believing be. No longer Thomas then denied, 
He saw the feet, the hands, the side. Thou art my Lord and God, he cried. Alleluia, alleluia. How blessed are they who have not seen and yet whose faith hath constant been. For they eternal life shall win. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you for that musical offering. The scripture today is taken from the book of John, verses, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Robert and Sarah, for that musical offering that ties right into our scripture reading for today. You know, uh, several years ago, an article appeared in a small local newspaper. It, seemed a, it seems a government letter had arrived at the home of a South Carolina resident who had recently died. The letter was addressed to the woman who had died. And it said in part, your food stamps will be discontinued if effective March 1st because we received notice that you passed away. <laughs> may God bless you. You may reapply if there is a change in your circumstances. Now, it's a true story, and little stories like this catch our attention primarily because, you know, they are so unbelievable. We find ourselves shaking our heads. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Why are some stories, when we first hear them, simply unbelievable? What makes a difference between believing or not believing something? Clearly, it has to do with measuring a situation against our everyday experience or our everyday expectations. It's difficult for us to believe something that does not fit or match our experience. And yet that's exactly what was happening in the scripture passage that Sarah shared with us this morning. 
It was on that day of resurrection that that first Easter that Jesus himself appeared to the disciples and spoke with them. But Thomas, one of the 12 disciples, was not with the others at that time. When Thomas returns, the others tell him that they have seen Jesus, but he doesn't believe them. He wants proof, just like many of us would. Many of us would as well. He wants to see for himself. He wants to touch the place where Jesus has been wounded. Well, one week later, Jesus appears again. And this time, Thomas is there. Christ says, reach out. Put your hand in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And when he does, the recognition occurs instantly. My Lord and my God. It's, a, it's, it's not my Lord and my God. It's, it's a proclamation. My Lord and my God. It's as if Thomas were saying, it is you. I know you. I recognize you. It really is you. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, describes this passage as one which defines faith what faith is all about. He says that our faith, the faith we carry, should be the faith of Thomas, he says, which allowed him, which allowed him to say with boldness, my Lord and my God. Wesley goes on to call faith the ground of our hope, the ground of our, like a grounding of our hope. He's saying that faith is, is an anchor. Faith is a foundation that holds an assurance that God is working transformationally in our lives and in our world. What is it that allows us also to proclaim my Lord and my God? What is it that allows us to recognize resurrection? Jesus says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Why does he say that? Why would he say that? I think it's because for those who were not eyewitnesses, recognizing resurrection must come from a place deeper than our outward senses. The ground of our hope is a trustfulness that God's power over death and despair is alive and active and moving in our world. I've shared this before, but every so often I will be talking with someone, uh, you know, it could be, you know, one of you, or it could be someone that, uh, you know, that I'm at the hospital or, or, or somehow connected to our congregation. And I'll be talking with someone who has received, you know, one of the prayer shawls that come from our church. And people in the hospital or people who are ill at home sometimes receive uh, one of the shawls. And sometimes someone will say to me, I was really strengthened. I was really strengthened by that. I could feel the congregation's love. I could feel the prayers of the church members. It gave me peace, it gave me strength, it gave me hope. I I felt God's presence with that prayer shawl. And you know, the ones I've talked to, I look look them directly in the eye and they are not, they're not just being nice and they're not just being polite when they say that. They really mean, they really seem to mean it, right? What would a person's outward senses tell them about a prayer shawl? You know, the yarn, is, the yarn is kind of soft and it's very nice and soft. The colors are beautiful or comforting. It feels warm when wrapped around the shoulders. And yet these folks are responding to something more. These folks are responding to something out of the ground of their hope, recognizing life and strength and resurrection that comes, comes from a place of trustfulness that is deeper than our outward senses. I recently came across uh, this picture. Kyle, you want to put that picture up there? Some of you may recognize this. Uh, this is this uh, is in Oklahoma City, and this is the memorial uh, to the people that died in the bombing in Oklahoma City. And what those are, uh, you can't see it very well from here, but those are actually chairs. And they kind of glow at night, but there's a there's a chair in, there's a, there's chairs in these field in this field, and they are they represent each and every person that died in the bombing at the federal building in Oklahoma City. And uh, many of you remember that day in 1995. Thank thank you, Kyle. That, 
event happened in the week right after Easter. Just like this past week, the week just following Easter in 1995. And you know, until 9-11, it was the largest act of terrorism that our, nat- that our nation had ever seen. 168 people died in that blast. 19 of them were children. Almost 700 more were injured that day. On that day, a woman named Wendy Lambert was going about her work as a physical therapist in Oklahoma when she heard on the radio that the federal building in Oklahoma City had been bombed. And she didn't know why, but, you know, she was a therapist, but she felt compelled to go downtown. And even though she couldn't understand or explain the urge within her to go to that scene, she went anyway like like so many heroes who move themselves toward danger. She traveled right into the epicenter of that horror. She spent the day helping in whatever way she could. She assisted medical personnel on the site. But as the hours wore on, this internal question persisted. You know, why had she felt compelled that day to come down? Well, Wendy worked all day at that site. And in the evening, she began to drive home when unexpectedly her mother called from Choctaw, the town where her parents lived, to help a friend her father had gone that morning to an appointment at the federal building. He had not returned, said her mother. In that moment, Wendy said, I knew he had lost his life. As it turned out, her father was, in fact, one of the victims of the bombing that day. As Oklahoma City residents dealt with this unspeakable loss and tragedy, the people, including United Methodists in that region, responded as never before. St. Luke's United Methodist Church, which wasn't very far away, sheltered hundreds of people that were displaced by that disaster. They assisted families desperate to locate loved ones and grieving those grieving deaths. They served thousands of meals to survivors and to rescue workers. They also staffed six phone lines around the clock and made care packages and even provided a room for the news media that day or for several weeks. The pastor of St. Luke's United Methodist Church, Bob Long, identified the response of their congregation as a significant lesson from that terrible time. He said, you take what life has dealt you and you build life upon it. In those kind of moments, I think God does strengthen us if we ask for God's guidance. Then he quoted Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, present nor future, nor any powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That pastor says you hear it at memorial services, you read it in your theology books, but when you live it, When you live through these kinds of experiences and you look back, you know it's true. We go forward, he says, as people of hope. We rely on the ground, the anchor of our hope. Pastor Long recalled that day 27 years ago now, looking into their huge auditorium. He said about 400 people were there in their great hall. Some needed a place to stay. Some were counselors and some were volunteers. Some people were eating, clothing was hanging from the light fixtures. Church members sat talking with strangers. Everybody was gathered there either to be comforted or to do the comforting, he said. At one point, he said he was puzzled to find people unloading and setting up refrigerators and freezers in one of the church's hallways. They told him, you're gonna need these. Then food began arriving from restaurants all over the city. Suddenly, he said, I love this quote. He says, I sure was glad I had all these refrigerators out in the hallway that I hadn't asked for to take care of all the food that I didn't know I was going to receive, to take care of all the people that I hadn't known would be there who were suddenly showing up, Pastor Long said. Those folks were responding to something out of the ground of their hope, recognizing life and strength and resurrection that came from a place of trustfulness that was deeper than their outward senses. Today, Wendy Lambert, the woman I told you about earlier, is an associate pastor at that same church, St. Luke's United Methodist Church. Wendy didn't know why she was pulled to that place where her father died on that day 27 years ago, but God knew. The message that Wendy received that day was that she was to be a witness to love in the midst of unbelievable, unfathomable tragedy. 
She was to be a witness to God's transforming, resurrecting power. She was living out of the ground, the anchor of her hope. Wendy has since shared her story in many places. She even traveled to Newtown, Connecticut in the years after the school shooting there in 2012. She told those Newtown residents about God's presence when heart breaks, when hearts break, and told them about how God acts through good people who respond in time of crisis. God grieves. God grieves in those moments, moments, but God also works through the kindness of all these different people. We have to rise up, she says, with courage and hope. We have to do the good and kind things. It makes a difference. That's what really changes lives. One of the things I take from these remembrances from Oklahoma City is that people of faith are open to God's prompting and to God's leading, to God's nudges, if you will. Easter people welcome the good, but they see in the bad, whatever that might be, pain, hurt, grief, illness, they see opportunities to share love, to share compassion, opportunities for growth and guidance. As we said so many times during Holy Week, people of faith are about the business of transforming despair and hopelessness through love. Like Thomas and even beyond Thomas, the people of Oklahoma City went back to the ground of their hope. In trustfulness, they believed in resurrection and even recognized resurrection even when they had not yet seen. They lived their lives as Easter people. You know, during our offering time today, Lindy is going to sing that song, Oceans, that many of you know. Many of you know that song. And if you think about the words to that song, it's based on the idea of stepping out in faith, taking a step of faith, stepping into the unknown, asking God's spirit to guide us and carry us forward as people of new life, people of hope, people of resurrection. There's an image that I want to leave with you today. It's an image for the church and for individual Christians in the world that we live in, our world of hurt and terror and fear and pain. It's the image from that First United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City. Not St. Luke's that I told you about, but First United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City on the day after that explosion. First United Methodist Church is right across the street, was right across the street from the federal building. In fact, the sanctuary was only about 130 feet away. The sanctuary itself was almost completely destroyed. Entire walls were blown away, glass and rubble were everywhere, but when emergency teams, when they entered the sanctuary, they were taken aback. The Easter lilies that sat there on the communion table on Easter morning, on Easter Sunday, they stood there completely unharmed. Silent witness in the midst of the rubble. I want us to take that image with us today. May that image remind us of the strength of God's love to prevail over fear, despair, suffering, and death. The promise of Easter is that new hope and new life are possible. Hope exists because of a risen Christ who is not bound by our limitations, a risen Christ who can be discovered moving among us in our world today. Perhaps we recognize resurrection in a person like Wendy. Perhaps we recognize resurrection in the face of a single mom who has survived an abusive situation. Maybe we see it in the eyes of a father who's been reconciled to a son. Maybe we recognize resurrection in the eyes of a patient who has learned to live with a chronic illness. Maybe one of our Wesley neighbors or one of our FaithWorks families feels new hope and new life when they look out the window and see how one of our church volunteers has cleaned or beautified their yard. Think about the kindergarten children who will be filled with joy and excitement tomorrow when they see the beautiful colors on their playground. And you know, perhaps someone who has lost everything in a flood or a tornado will be handed one of the hygiene kits that some of you put together yesterday. New life, hope, and resurrection are recognized in many ways. And here's the most amazing part. Perhaps someone else recognizes resurrection in you. Perhaps someone else will recognize resurrection in you. You know, there really are some stories that don't fit our experience or our expectations. But like Thomas, we can be thankful 
that God isn't limited by that. We can be thankful that God isn't limited by that. I'm going to invite our musicians to come forward right now. As they're coming forward, let's bring our hearts together in a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Creating God, loving God, God of new life and hope, we pray that you might come alive in us. May you enter the dark places of our lives to reveal your light. May you enter the wounded places to bring healing. May you enter our despair to bring hope. May Thomas's words, my Lord and my God, become for us a proclamation, a shout of joy as we recognize your presence, as we recognize resurrection, and realize that you are indeed alive and active and moving in our lives. In the name of the one who makes all things new, we lift this prayer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward right now. And as our ushers are coming forward, uh, let's be prepared right now to receive our morning offering. Great unknown where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep. My faith will stand, and I will call upon your name. Arise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. When feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start Arise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Without 
borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are Please be seated. Thank you, music team. As we move into our time of prayer, I want to lift up a couple of families that we are continuing to hold in prayer. One is, uh, of course, the family of Maxine Adams, who had the celebration of life here the other day. And uh, we pray continued prayers of strength uh, for, for Maxine's uh, family. Also, we're continuing to pray for the family of Marge Reed. Um, I announced last Sunday that Marge had, had died just a few days before. I think it was on Thursday prior to Easter. And so we hold Marge, Marge's husband, Jerry, and, and their entire family in our prayers during this time. We're also holding Dorothy Edwards and, uh, and others in our congregation in prayer uh, during this time. We ask that uh, we, we are going to be putting out a newsletter here in about a week and uh, would, ask, would invite you to, to look at that prayer list and, and all the people that we are, are listing there and to, uh, to hold them in prayer in the coming days. Well, let's bring our hearts together now as we come together in a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we are grateful for your presence here this morning. We feel your strength as we gather in community to worship you. Each week we share these concerns and thanksgivings which are spoken aloud, as well as others that reside in our hearts. During this Easter season, we thank you for the great gift that you have given us. The knowledge that your love can triumph over darkness, despair, and death. God, in those weeks following the resurrection, the disciples were amazed that Jesus was still with them, still a part of their lives. Lord, like Thomas, many of us struggle with doubt. Sometimes we seek proof. We seek something concrete. Help us this morning to understand all that that we struggle with. Help us return to that ground, that anchor of our faith. Help us to use senses that we are not used to using. You would have us see with eyes of trustfulness. You would have us feel with our heart to know that you are truly present with us. 
Loving God, this morning we grieve for those families who have lost loved ones, not just in our congregation, but throughout the nation and the world, those who have lost loved ones to senseless violence. We pray for those in Ukraine who have lost everything. Be with those who are fleeing, not just in Ukraine, but around the world, both human-caused disasters as well as natural disasters. Be with those who are lost and afraid. Be with those friends and family members and workers who are seeking to show love and support to those in need during a time of stress or heartbreak. Loving God, for some who gather here this morning, it is a time of hope and joy and expectation. For others, it may be a time of stress or struggle. You know the joys, you know the longings, you know the hurts, the disappointments that we bring this day. Allow us to to hold them out to you, knowing that you receive all that is upon our heart, knowing that you receive our prayers and you take them unto yourself. We pray this in the name of the risen one, the one who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We move now into that time of communion, that time where we come once again to the table, where we come once again to the sacrament. Our church practices an open communion, meaning any who wish to come forward are welcome to do so, to receive the elements uh, as we share communion together today. We are reminded that whenever we gather as a church family, we're much like those disciples who sat with Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. It was on that night as Jesus shared uh, a meal with his disciples, his friends, that he took the bread of the Passover meal And after giving God thanks and praise, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And then again after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving God thanks and praise, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink this, each of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of this, remember me. And so we who gather here today, the the current day disciples of Jesus, we do remember. We remember in a way that brings the very presence of the risen Christ back into our midst. Just as we share this one cup, we are reminded of what we call our oneness in Christ, the, the fact that that God connects us to one another and to others in our congregation. The, the congregation that will be here tonight at 6 p.m., those who are uh, viewing our service on the live stream or on the filmed version later in the week, we're reminded that we are connected to one another through Christ. And just as we share bread that has been broken, we're reminded that each one of us comes before God broken in some way, in need of God's love, in need of God's hope, in need of God's forgiveness, in need of God's healing touch. So we come to the table in that spirit. I'm going to invite our communion helpers to come forward and our ushers to come forward at this time. As they're coming forward, let me share with you whether you're coming forward for communion or receiving there in your pew, my friends, the bread of life given for you. The cup of God's love shared with you. Receive now these holy gifts in great thanksgiving. Let's have our ushers come forward as you feel so led to do so. Please come and share this holy meal.
Amen. Thank you, music team. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Great to have you here. I'm going to invite you to stand so we can be together for our benediction, our sending forth. Do want to invite you down for our time of uh, fellowship and sharing down in the social hall, which is right below us, and take the stairs down over here. And... Uh, 
receive our benediction. My friends, go now in peace, love God, and serve the people. And may our God, the God who helps us to see resurrection in our lives and in our world, may that God go with you now. And through this coming week, go in God's peace, go in God's presence, and go in God's grace. Amen. Thank you.